going to start the stream. We're live. Hello, world. So did you, how, I heard you guys did the, the live stream on like Twitch and you actually set up the, the telescope. How'd that go? We made it halfway through. We, we got flummoxed for lack of a Windows laptop. Yes. So yes. I, I went and stole one from my husband because mm -hmm. he had one that he only uses when he's configuring um, Arduino boards of different sorts. Yep. And um, he and I can co-parent this Windows box because um, yep. I doubt he'll be trying to configure Arduinos the same time I'm configuring a telescope. Right. Well, so did you figure out how you have to like connect to the telescope's own Wi-Fi signal? And then install that software to actually so control. I the... saw it. Yeah. We're going to try it live on Sunday. So okay. Sundays are going to become CosmoQuest Astronomy Photometry Learning Hour. I got. I I did figure it out. So I, you know, if I had my laptop in front of me, I could make that telescope move. So and... I don't know if we have the exact same mount. I suspect we might. Yeah. Did you notice that there's the North Star scope through the polar axis? It's super exciting. You don't actually need an eyepiece. You just look through the mount. You look through the mount to see the North Star to do like a rough, to do a rough polar alignment. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right. You should actually be able to get it good enough that you only need to use the CCD. Right. The, so I actually, so I did kind of accessorize. Yeah, so, I can see. Yeah. So I got a, uh, I got a eyepiece. Sure, Dustin's going to be mad that I spent money, but come on. I'm sure I was going to pawn this eyepiece right out. Anyway. Now, the question is did you spend money by buying it from a local astronomy uh, no. group who will. Okay, that's sad. No. And. See, so, yeah, I'm going to buy old unused equipment from our local astronomy club so that. Uh, I can get random peripherals and mm -hmm. they can turn the money into, we have a local library lending program where they That's actually cool. buy telescopes to put in all the local libraries. So That's awesome. And I also I'm got pay it a T adapter for my Canon camera. I need so, to do that. Yeah. So, so now I can do visual <laughs> observing, just looking through the eyepiece. I can do hooking up the camera and then but then we've got the very complicated um, actual camera system, the CCD. So that's going to be a whole other whole other world. Yes. Now, have you figured out how to mount a camera on the telescope yet? Yes. Okay. I haven't been able to make it do an image yet. So. Okay. Yeah, I was able to bring up the feed from the camera to my laptop. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. <laughs> Uh, Arnold B, Astro B, Arnold Post, sorry, Astro B, uh, Bill Sugden, Bill K, Brian Stab, Carolyn B, Coalfire, Colin Jones, Daniel McCool, Guido Bibra, Hal F, John Suffill, John Victor, Jordan Couch, Quadlibet, Nancy Graziano, Noel Ruppenthal, Ocean McIntyre, Phoenix Torres, how sweet, how cool hey, is that? Hey, Phoenix. R Instro, Shannon Melton, Susie Murph, Umu, William Bradley, Yamagashi san and Zap Fan Zap Fan. Hey everybody, welcome to a uh, regular episode of Astronomy Cast. Uh, so, if you are wondering what it is on Earth you have stumbled into, we're going to be doing a uh, live episode of Astronomy Cast, and then we're going to stick around and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. But I suspect what's going to happen is we're going to have a big conversation about your recommendations of books um for, of science fiction books and i think we're gonna do so some people are having some problems hearing is that right that's weird can you hear me okay or is this both of us that you're having problems on Because I can see, I did boost my audio levels a bit more, and I can definitely see. Okay, all right. 
Pe- people are saying we're fine. So there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, right. Okay. Right. So what I think I'm going to do, which is, which is different from what we normally normally we don't engage with the community much during the show but i want to get you folks to let us know your recommendations for books that you like and then i will sort of mention them in as we're actually recording the core podcast because we're going to run out of ideas and we want you folks no we're not We'll see what happens. <laughs> Should we run out of ideas? Uh, I would love, but I would love to just add some recommendations from from some of some of the fans as well. So, uh, so I think we'll, this episode may be a little different. In that, you know, I'm going to be bringing the, that conversation into it. All right, let's get uh, let's get rolling. Okay. Let me know when you're ready to. Oh crap! I've been so busy pulling up book lists, I forgot to open Audacity. Ooh, Goodreads, that's a good idea. Do you do you track your books on Goodreads? Um, not as regularly as I should, but yeah. like every couple months I'll go in and core dump what I've been reading onto it. Yeah, I should too. It's a good idea. I I just I don't use it at all. I like it because uh, its algorithm is actually pretty good at recommendations. And I will often have a day of, well, I have to spend the entire day cleaning my house. I need a book that will take that long. Recommend something, internet. Right. So, but like an audio book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But so much stuff is now audible. Um, yes. I do read on Kindle. I do read on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and I still have wet hair. So sorry, internet. You get to see me having a Friday. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Say when. I'm ready. I'm pressing record. It's recording. I have also pressed record. Hello, Chad. Hi, Chad. Astronomy Cast, episode 469, modern sci-fi for the science lover. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always is Dr. Pamela Gay, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Great. Uh, So I guess we're going to give people some recommendations, some books we like, some some ideas of of stuff that we've been reading. Hopefully this will set you up to be able to buy some gifts for the for the science lover in your family. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Yes. I. The way I look at it is currently our world is quite literally, if you're in California, on fire. Oh, yes. And and given everything that's going on, sometimes it's just nice to completely escape into another reality. And uh, my alternate realities of choice tend to be science fiction, fantasy and urban fantasy. So we're going to take you down those rides um, and talk about the ones that actually have like fairly reasonable science Mm -hmm. or are good enough that you should read them anyways sounds good now how far back do we want to go like you said kind of modern sci-fi you know i'd I'd like to stay about that yeah i'd like i'd like to try and stay as modern as possible to give some new writers okay um growth not that some of them that we're going to recommend need it yep but i saw this great quote are we yes this is part of the episode now yes um i saw this great (laughs) tweet the other day i think it was by emily finke uh she goes by celix just about everywhere and if i'm quoting the right person which i hope i am or i'm just a doofus um it was we need to stop worrying that if we don't recommend Tolkien and Heinlein to small space loving kids, that those authors will go unread because that's not going to happen. So it's time to start saying here are new things written for the modern age that have the same mores that we have. Go read these. Uh, Cause a lot of the older stuff is just kind of like, it's clearly a different time. Yes. 
So where do you want to start? What's a book that you've read fairly recently that you liked the science in it? So this is actually the one that Susie wanted us to do the entire episode on. Um, the Bob verse. Uh, I am Legion. I am Bob is the first book in the series. And this is one I think that you've read as mm -hmm. well. Yep, I read it. Oh, based and on your recommendation. What can I say? Yeah. Um, and, and this is a book that takes this idea that you've been talking about since day zero of this podcast of let's download our brain into a computer. And then the computer goes off and like populates the universe with other computers. And it's kind of awesome because this is the way you want to be able to do long distance travel. Yeah, I mean the 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 gist of the book if you haven't if if you haven't read it is that a computer programmer dies and is um turned into a spaceship and uh it becomes the brains of the operation for a spaceship and then uh things happen so he's a little more unchained than I think anyone was expecting and he sort of takes matters into his own hands as he sets about or his own wires his own wires his own remotely operated um high velocity uh spacecraft subspacecraft and 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 uses that to then kind of colonize and make contact with other species and and but at the same time trying to deal with the politics that are happening on earth and trying to be you know, an ally to a civilization that kind of doesn't want him anymore, but needs him and doesn't know they need him. And, and at the same time, trying to sort of deal with the the wider universe. And I totally agree. I really enjoyed the just the ideas of this kind of exponential thinking about what does it mean to be to have access to the raw equipment, the raw facilities of, of a solar system to make more copies of yourself. And what does it mean kind of philosophically to have more copies of yourself out there in in the world? And how do you talk to yourself when you're talking to your, another version of you and so on? So I really enjoyed it. I've only read the first one though. How you've gone further? I've read all of them. Mm -hmm. How have you not read all of them? I don't know. Someone made, made me put together a telescope. Uh, I put together yeah. a telescope. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll catch up. I'll catch. Up. I've read a bunch that you haven't read, so, so, careful there. Okay, so what have you read? Well, so, but can you finish? But just like, <laughs> how does the rest of the series go? Is it spoilers? No, well, don't spoil. So, so bottom line, it has some really cool ideas in it. This, this idea of basically being a factory ship that you can reproduce, redo, reprogram, recreate, and upgrade your own body. Who doesn't want to be able to upgrade their own body occasionally? Um, really cool ideas in it. Totally worth, uh, totally worth the download and the read. Yeah. Um, okay, well, then the one that I'm going to recommend is Seven Eves, which is by Neil Stevenson. And not uh, so much the space exploration. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> oh, you, thank you, Google, for jumping in on this conversation. Um, so I think you're wrong. But that's okay. Um, I might be the only one. So, so the, the, the concept of Seven Eves is that uh, astronomers discover or everyone discovers that the moon falls apart and just cracks up into pieces and forms this ring around the Earth. And astronomers calculate that the, um, the debris from it is going to impact the earth and essentially make the planet uninhabitable within a very short period of time. And the, what they do is it's this race to essentially save as much of humanity as possible by going out into orbit to avoid as the atmosphere gets superheated and, and everybody dies. And it's the book is broken up into two halves, the first half being leading up to leading up to and sort of the culmination of the event. And then the second part is sort of thousands of years later. How, you know, what has human society become? And you and, and you've read it as well, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's a 
beautiful series. Uh, not se- well, it, it's like multiple books in one book. It's two books, yeah, yeah. And a lot uh, of people like half of it and don't like the other half. And it it gets into interesting biological ideas. Um, what is epigenetics, which is something that's only really starting to get talked about in science fiction. And the the idea that we can change ourselves purposefully from generation to generation simply by learning to turn on and off things that are already within us. And that's just a cool metaphor while also being super cool science. So, I mean, I think with the space flight side, are you talking about like you weren't a big fan of the the pre pre uh, event space flight or the post event space flight so so i this i this is a multi part series that we're doing on on books and i was just trying to focus today on books where we get out and explore space mm-hmm. so so here we have um, some of the Kim Stanley Robinson's ones, for instance, uh, such as Aurora, where it's the consequences of a generation ship. And how is it that as you uh, pass from one generation to the next, how do you deal with the fact that you're trapped on this spaceship with so many things that can go right and so many things more that can go completely wrong? And as always, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, who is a guy, in case you didn't know this, uh, he he does so much of the psychology right as well as getting the science right. And the way he has the personal interactions of the characters who are just struggling and then they're like, OK, we're, we're coming home now. And all of the technologies that they have to figure out and how much the world they're coming back to has changed. Um, And it gets into the idea that you and so many others love of accelerating things using giant lasers and then trying to get a hold of Earth to decelerate using giant lasers. Right, right. Um, uh, Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't read that one. I've read all of Kim Stanley Robinson, and so the other Kim Stanley Robinsons, I mean, these aren't uh, space travel, but these are really realistic stories about the colonization terraforming of Mars. There's the sort of the three-part series, the the green Mars, no, red Mars, green Mars, blue Mars, red Mars, blue Mars. Blue Mars, Green Mars. I never remember the order yeah, of blue yeah. and green. Yeah, so, right. Um, but, the, the, you know, about sort of the first colonists that make their way to Mars and attempt to sort of make a habit, you know, make the place habitable, moving to actually starting to terraform the planet and sort of the far future when it is uh, much, much, uh, sort of a much more habitable world. And the, the level of detail, I mean, if you're you can just see Elon Musk read that book, read those books like five times. It was just like, yes, this is what we're doing. And uh, and a lot of his ideas are are, are set on that. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to give props to The Martian, which is still got to be one of the most sort of accurate and realistic representations of what it's going to be like to explore space to get out there on other worlds and and sort of what are the intricacies i mean the level of math the computer programs that andy Weir created to simulate these this transportation from world to world is just is crazy um yes. now i haven't read artemis yet um they were going to send me a I copy of the book either. no it's on my list and that's his new and that's his new book i did get a chance to spend a lot of time with talking with him just about the details that he put into the 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 moon base and the and the ideas that he had for it so that was that was pretty great but i think for anybody who is really into science fiction everyone i've given the martian to has just read it cover to cover or you know who's listened to the audiobook has just snapped it up in a heartbeat so uh yeah so so then we have the books where essentially various aliens somehow have a way of beaming into human heads or otherwise through archaeological ruins or something else influencing man to 
basically explore in ways they hadn't planned. And I think the first of this series was probably Contact, which is too old to count for what we're talking about today in terms of new books. But I think the most famous of the new ones in this series is the Expanse series, which is, yes, it's a TV show. I know it's a TV show. <laughs> You're welcome to love the TV show. It was a book first. Go read the books. He's still writing new ones. The universe is still expanding. Uh, well, I mean, it's two writers. James S.A. Corey is two people. I did not you didn't know that. that. Yeah, when now I yes. Yeah, when you talk to James S. A. Corey, you are actually talking to two people, which has happened to me and is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, because you never know which one it is, and you just get an I this and you know, and so but but they act as one. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great it's a great idea to to do that. I mean, you don't get the credit for being the writer of this really wildly successful sci-fi series and, and television show. I haven't read the books, but my dad's read the books. My <laughs> wife's read the books. So clearly I'm in this bubble and, you know, they're on the Kindle. They're ready to go. But And I actually like the books a lot more than the TV show. And I like the TV show. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So I... I... I'm so nervous to give anything away because I know how many of you out there love the TV show, but it gets to the point where they even get to go beyond our own solar system. So go read the books, keep reading the books, read all the books. And there's just new intriguing idea after intriguing idea that will suck you in and keep you hoping that eventually we find our own potentially deadly but yet awesome and technologically advanced um thing that allows us to get out further than we've gone before but is it i mean is it one of those situations like have you read game of thrones and watched the the show have you yeah done both of those i don't need to read any more game of thrones books <laughs> right i'm done it's okay <laughs> i the the TV show is plenty for me, and it's it's great, and it does the job. If you've read some Game of they they stretch on a little long. Yeah, there's a lot of side plots that go on, but I understand that these the, books aren't like that. Yeah, that's these what I books understand. are concise and clean and fast paced and suck you in, and and read the books. You won't regret all it. All right, all right. I will. Uh, I solemnly swear that I will read the books shortly. So, um, so with Game of Thrones, I think it takes longer to read the first book than to watch the first season. Yes. Not true with these books. Yeah. Yeah, and those, and you know, and the, the science in them, with the kinds of places that the way that people live and the the gravity forces involved and. And so on. All that is is very realistic. The one gotcha is this space drive, right? But they handle it well. We we made a magic space drive. Yeah. Now what? Right. That's all. Yeah. yeah. And and I'm okay with occasionally making magical space drives. Yeah, that's you know everyone gets that. I forgot, who is it? Was it Phil had that rule? Someone has a rule. I think yeah, so. I think it's Phil has this rule that you get kind of one uh, magic space drive or one, you know, the equivalent of the magic space drive. And then you go from there. I like Old Man's War. I was going to suggest that yeah. next. Yeah. And did you hear that Netflix has picked it up for a TV series? I I did and have you actually read his new book the collapsing empire which is a different universe no so so well, let's talk about old man's war first and then we'll go into okay so so old man's war um the the basic premise is that our soldiers are the old people of earth who have um moved beyond their day-to-day -day lives and have been promised that they can be young if only they join the military. And they don't know what's going to happen. They simply know they will be made young again. And 
after they've served in the military for a certain number of years, then they'll be released to live in their young bodies for, for however long. And it's one heck of a war. They're, they're fighting other civilizations. They're trying to create new colony worlds. The technology is on point. They use bioengineering as well. Um, it's got all the little check boxes and also takes into account things like it, it you have to break the universe somehow if you're going to go faster than the speed of light and their interesting way of breaking it yes is every time they make the jump from one point to another the universe splits yeah so Every time you see someone, it's actually a completely different person than the one you saw in that universe like before. Yeah, it's, it's it's very similar to like the Rick and Morty sort of multiple multiple universes idea. So they have this thing called the skip drive where they – when they jump, they are moved to the new position of a different version of the universe and yeah. then the universe moves on from there. So they've literally disappeared from the old universe, discarded, and now are in the in the new universe. And I think that that idea is is sort of is the larger symbolism for for what we do with old people. That right that that this just this idea of it being discarded and not required anymore, and just moving on to the next to the next place. Damn the consequences. And so I think that is. Uh, a really, it's just a really great idea. And you're just, it's this, you know, if you've seen some Rick and Morty's, there's some situations where they literally just going to go, well, that's it for this universe. Let's, yep. let's go somewhere else and, and try again. Cause this one's all ruined. And sometimes that's what you just need to do. Now in old man's war, it's not quite that uh, useful a splitting of the universes because it's pretty much, um, transparent to everyone that the universe is a new universe it's you're still seeing the same people you're still seeing the same consequences but it's this intellectual knowledge that's just weird yeah well and, and just like they don't really know how this thing works yeah which is yeah. just great like we don't know it works let's go to war because we have to and yes. so let's just make this deal with the devil to to do that so now you're saying that that he's got a new universe that he's working on yes so this is uh the interdependency is the name of the universe the name of the series and the collapsing empire is book one it's it's fairly new came out in march of this year and in this particular series you have uh it goes to that idea of gates and tunnels and subspace that you're traveling through. And so people are slipping from one place to another through gates that have particular endpoints, particular beginning points. And once you accidentally fall out of subspace, they call it something different. Um, you're kind of stuck. And one of the problems that they're running into is they're finding that the gates are moving. And how do you deal with this? And how does this affect commerce? And thus the word collapsing falls into it. Right. So it, it has this whole inter necessity. That's not a word. It has all of these different planets that rely on each other where this is the one that one kind of fruit comes from. This is the one that has this one other thing that it comes from. And it's very much like the EU food restrictions where champagne has to come from champagne. Uh, in this case, the unions, the, red, the restrictions, all are saying this can only come from this one place without special licensing agreements. So everything falls apart if you don't have the ability to get goods between these different worlds, not all of which can fully support humans on their own. And it really speaks to a lot of our modern humans couldn't exist where they are on certain places in the earth with without all of the transport that we have now so what happens if 
if those transportation mechanisms go away. So I've got a book that's a little older, um, which is back in the 70s, and that's <laughs> by Joe Haldeman, and that's The Forever War. But I really like yes. the way the space travel happens in this. So a lot of parallels with Old Man's War, you know, person signs up as a, you know, part of the military and joins this elite fighting force. But the thing that's kind of strange about it is that the way the space travel works, it's highly relativistic. So the Haldeman put in sort of did all these calculations for what would happen if you traveled at the at the speeds that would be required to be able to move from place to place. And what that means is that literally home, you disconnect from where you came from by hundreds, thousands of years, and it totally distorts and kind of messes with just your idea of what does it mean to to be defending a world that has no even idea that you exist anymore and yet you're out there out on the front lines and you know the time down every time you move from front to front from from battlefield to battlefield time distorts heavily for the people back at home so I uh, highly recommend it and they've done a couple more books as well but but I really enjoyed this this idea of like what are the implications of relativistic space travel for a society that sends people out doing this and and you see this getting used in uh, again a somewhat older book uh, Orson Scott cards and I know there's issues with Orson Scott card in in Orson Scott cards Enders series you you see this traveling fast enough puts you in a different aging pattern so that you're essentially skipping down the generations by traveling from world to world and it deals with the consequences of that the redemption of that which then harkens back to the old jack campbell books where you have your war hero who died who turned out to have just been actually in stasis and what are the consequences to bringing back your dead hero on a civilization? It turns out that civilizations don't deal so well with having to deal with the realities of their war heroes. What is, uh, did you have some more? I have a couple of recommendations that have, that have come in from the viewers in the chat that I just wanted to throw in as well. So, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny. Um, uh, so one other set of books to, to bring forward is the uh, a live series. Well, it's the Generations uh, trilogy by Scott Sigler. Uh, it's Alive, Alight, and Alone. And uh, it takes a completely different look at the generation ship. And if I say anything else, I will give the book away. But if you're looking for YA that will also scare the bejesus out of you while being YA, um, Scott Sigler's uh, Generations trilogy, um, and they really are books that should be taught side by side with Lord of the Flies. So when I say they get scary, think Lord of the Flies on a Generation spaceship. Well, that's great. Uh, speaking of Generation spaceship, and I haven't read it yet, but I but I like uh, Tom Merritt, who uh, does uh, Court Killers, Daily Tech News Show, does Sword and Laser, and has done a bunch of books. And he's got a new Generation ship book out called Pavaria. And so uh, that has just come out. And I want to hopefully I'll get a chance to read that soon enough. And uh, but just to give some props to some uh, some some writers out there. So so you said we had some recommendations. From yeah. The yeah. So just a couple of recommendations that we got from some people. But, you know, go ahead and keep putting them in there. Um, the Dark Force trilogy. So I guess I can I can mention that uh, that's that's the three body problem. And this is one that everyone had been nagging mm -hmm. me to read because they know I love the Fermi paradox so much. And the book is the sort of a lot of people thought liked it as sort of one of the best explanations for the Fermi paradox of why we haven't found any aliens. So I don't want to, you know, spoil anything. But uh, it's a it's a good book and very weird. It's a very weird book because it's this. Uh, the, the book is about it's based in China. And it's it's a Chinese book, like it's written in Chinese, it's yeah, been translated, it's translated in English. Yeah. And the sort of the gist of the book is that there's a, you know, 
people have been receiving these communications from an alien civilization and have been sort of incorporating that into video games and sort of preparing ourselves for uh, for meeting them. And you get these really interesting insights into what how this alien civilization operates and how they deal with a fairly unique environmental problem that they have to face and how that it, sort of baked into their culture. So it's a hard read. It is a hard read for sure. Do not do it while distracted. I I read the books while distracted and need to reread them because I know I've read them and that's all I can tell you right now. <laughs> right. Uh Noel Ripenthal recommends uh Robert J. Sawyer's Factoring Humanity. And I've read a few no. Robert J. Sawyer books. I Yeah, I've never been disappointed by nope. his books. And he's Canadian, so you know. There you go. Uh who else have we got? Uh Werner Vinge books, uh Fire Upon the Deep, Deepest in the Sky. Um so I really enjoyed Fire Upon the Deep as a as, as sort of as a bad AI trying to take over a galaxy and the the people arrayed to try and stop it and this sort of very important um man what's the term for the like MacGuffin this MacGuffin falls on this alien world and this primitive civilization gets their hands on it and so MacGuffin that's the yeah this sort of this gadget, this gadget that just doesn't need to matter, doesn't okay. you know, has no purpose except to okay. serve as a story point. So okay. anyway, uh, good book, very weird. Um, weird books get some are more, good. Some more recommendations from people. And I think we're gonna. So bottom line, read, and we're gonna be doing yes. uh, more more parts in the series to hit on things like great books that discuss 3D printing, making, and uh, the the tech side of science fiction, and then also looking at biofiction and, and how biology and climate and all of that get addressed as well. So we want to encourage you to find your science everywhere and read, because it, it's how we can yeah. escape and think beyond ourselves. And especially like if you don't have time to read with your eyeballs now, read with your earballs, right? So you've got yeah. audiobooks that you can listen to and and you know, read while you're w walking around or while you're doing housework. Oh yeah, and it it's so easy nowadays to find good books. Audible.com actually will sync with your Kindle. So you can go back and forth from reading with your eyeballs to reading with your earballs. I like neat. that phrase. <laughs> All right. Well, well, then we'll pick this up next week. Sounds great, Fraser. Right. And now we save. Wow, that was long. <laughs> What number are we on? That was 469. I think. <laughs> yes. Okay. And I'm going to turn Dropbox off. There are birds battling in my bird feeder. I can hear them behind me. Invincible by Stanislaw Lem recommends Quad Libet. That sounds cool. Oh, I uh, Long I Way know. to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers, recommended by Phoebe McCullen. Yeah, that one's good as well. You've that that? one's less science, more human dynamics. It's a beautiful book. Apologies, I'm just looking for any more recommendations. Right, Nancy Graziano is saying, if I recall correctly, Phil Plate said that every sci-fi author gets one get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. That is inaccurate, but is necessary for the plot. And that's different from a MacGuffin, which is a gadget that 
is necessary for the plot. Okay. Uh, Robert Sawyer's Factoring Humanity. See, I hadn't read A Deepness in the Sky, so Arnstra was recommending that. Who's it by? It's by Werner Vinge as well. So I read Fire Upon the Deep, but I haven't read A Deepness in the Sky. Numenon by Lawstetter. That sounds cool. I apparently haven't read Deepness in the Sky either, but it is a Hugo winner. It's from 2009. John Morrison likes Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Who Sang. I haven't read that one. I've read piles of other Anne McCaffrey, most about, mostly about people flying around on dragons, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Giants Trilogy by James P. Hogan. Inherit the Stars, General Giants of Ganymede, and Giant Star. Okay, do we have any questions? Just people recommending books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so... Greg Not Bear. all episodes, Q and A's are as exciting as others. Are you ready for my? I haven't read the Ian M. Banks culture series. Oh, I've only read some of them, and then they didn't stay in my brain. I've read a bunch of Ian M. Banks books, but I haven't read the the uh, Consider Plebeus and and others. So I, you know, the ones that that the yeah. the drone barges are named after so i will get at that jordan couch wants to know could it be as paul stamets the great mycologist suggests that the universe itself is intelligent i'll pass it on to you pamela is the universe itself intelligent if it is it's really dumb <laughs> i i think that sagan's quote about we are the way that the universe perceives itself is one of the kind of most meaningful. My statement holds either way. <laughs> it's one of the most meaningful things. I, like that is that totally resonates with me and it sort of makes us feel important. So now that we're doing the question and answers, I'm turning on my space heater because I like I'm trying to curl into myself because it's cold in here. Aww, do it. John Drake wants to know where on earth we find the time to read all those books. We, I, I do a lot of, of audiobooks, so um, that's the way that I will try to process. Yeah, a lot it's of like books. fifty-five degrees in here. <laughs> um, yeah. So I wanted to know how we find the time to read books. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of time. I so I am the queen of multitasking. Um, and I know that it's not as efficient in general, but there's some things that it doesn't deplete my efficiency on. So Saturdays is a day that I spend the whole day cleaning laundry, fish tanks, stuff like that. Um, and I'll usually listen to an entire book on a Saturday. Um, then anytime I'm on a bike exercising, anytime I'm walking to and from work, yep. I'm I'm reading. Yep. Driving. Um, I, you know, driving, chores, going for walks. I've got people ask me what music I listen to. I don't listen to any music whatsoever. It's podcasts and audiobooks 100% of the I, time. I listen to music when I'm coding um, mm. and paying and, bills yeah. and things like that where words are death. Um, I always have noise present, apparently. Uh, but I also like try and set aside. And I fail at this a lot, but I try and set aside about 30 minutes before I go to bed to just read. And I try not to read the news or BuzzFeed or any of those other petty addictions. Um, so that's when like comicsology and my comic books are my friends and um, books that have only been re replaced, not replaced, released on Kindle or on paper. Um, so like I read all of the book burners, book one, um, one short story at a time sitting in my chair with my dog on me. One of the things that I do is before I go to bed, 
I will have one book going and I try to get through about 10% of the book a night before I go to bed. See, I'm not to be trusted with that. Because you I will, I will read the whole book. Right. No, for sure. And so this is where comic books and short stories are required because yeah. if if I limit myself to like one of the the paper, not the graphic novel com compendiums, um, I'm safe. Yeah. Where where I've been foiled lately is I've I've got a whole bunch of comic books through Humble Bundle. And I haven't figured out how to get them onto my iPad rationally. So if anyone out there has solved this problem, I want to know. Humble Bundle lets you send all of your books to your Kindle. You just have to- Up to 200 megabytes. Oh, but so the comic books are too big, right? Because yeah. I bought the previous Humble Bundle with a whole bunch of the sci-fi books. Oh and, yeah, and yeah, I get those my, all the time. Yeah, sent them to my Kindle. And they just yeah. came up with another one. And I also bought a couple of their audiobooks, which is how I got a yeah. whole pile of audiobooks piled up and ready to go. Um, so, but yeah, if they're too big, I use a piece of software called, um, oh, Catalyst. Hold on, let me see what it's called. So currently I'm looking at a future of downloading them to Caliber. my hard drive. It's called Caliber. So Cabling. it's a book manager. So yeah, Caliber. Okay. Calib, you know, Calib B R E, and you, uh, then you can plug. You can sort of upload all of your books into Caliber, and then you plug in your, your, Kindle into your computer, and then it tells you which ones are on the device and which ones aren't, and it lets you. You can maybe do this after the show. Uh, it lets you. <laughs> It lets you manage your Kindle and, and put things on and off the, the, the Kindle. It's great. It's it's a Swiss Army knife for managing stuff on your on your Kindle. So the question comes, does the, it support Mobi format? Yes. Yeah, it supports okay. Mobi. It supports uh, even PDFs. It'll convert them to Mobi files. Okay, so you cool. can sort of set it to either, and it'll support EPUB, and it'll it'll sort of handle all that and put them all onto the... Excellent. Uh, onto the book for you. Yeah, I know it's it's the it's the machine you wanted. Okay. Yep. Excellent. There you go. Done. Solved. Technical okay. support. Yay. Is ready. Here for you. Quad Limit is saying that you're gonna do a uh a tutorial on Rimworld. <laughs> so I you know, Rimworld is a game that I'm playing I've been playing had been playing a lot of now that they came up with they moved into beta, they finally finished Alpha eighteen and moved into beta. And it is like you are running this space colony and sort of micromanaging all these people to build farms and structures and defend against various attacks and environmental problems. Is it problems. based on the book? No. Okay. No, it's not based on any kind of book. So it's it's fun. It's a it's one of those sort of, you know, civilization, just one more turn kind of games. Don't uh, play Civ 6. Civ 6 is horrifying. I, 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 I don't know if other people agree with you, but um, but anyway, I don't I, I but I'm done quite a little bit. I'm, I've finished playing RimWorld now and now I've moved on to uh, I'm playing Dark Souls and uh, I'm going to be I'm playing some Fallout 4 survival mode. So cool. So don't don't do it this for me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a there's a a mod for Fallout Four called Frost that just looks super fun, really hard, but I, it looks like a lot of fun. So that's what I'm gonna probably be doing. Janelle Duncan wants to know how is the picture mass matching going on. Oh, on Image Detective. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> today in the office, we were doing the uh, best worst matches that people had submitted. Um, so it's going well. And the ones that aren't are fabulously wrong. Uh, we won't make fun of you publicly. Don't worry. Um, but but there's a lot of images. So folks go online, do a few images. I need to get better at saying, hey, while you're watching this show, go do science. Um, so yeah. Arjo and wants to know dog. what's your favorite mode of sci-fi transportation? I know mine. The teleporter? Stargate. Yes. By far. Yes. 
head and shoulders that you just have this awesome just ring that you walk through and now you're on another planet halfway across the galaxy i i really love that i mean again that's their gimmick yeah for for the for the series but what it does is just makes you don't have to think about all of the technology you just get to show up on these different worlds and have adventures and i i really like the stargate as my sort of favorite yeah. method of of transportation and and i if if I day to day needed to go that far, that would be my favorite. But right now, I just want a transporter beam. Mm -hmm. That would be even easier. Yeah. But you know, here's the question: transporter beam, is it a suicide booth or a method of transportation? I don't care. <laughs> okay, really, you would you would step <laughs> in a transporter knowing that there's a very good chance that it would be disassembling your existence but it would be opaque to me that that had happened i would as far as my perception of reality continued be the exact same person but but the you who stepped into i don't the care booth would really wow yeah this is clearly gonna have to be a future argument that we're gonna have because because <laughs> i I would never step in one of those infernal boxes. No way. I would I would be like Bones McCoy. But you would download your brain into a computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bit bit by bit in a way that is safe. Yes. Yeah. That's the only the only way to go is to slowly swap out your brain like planks in a ship. Any more questions? Uh, oh, Jordan Coach wants to know about string theory, and just to let, just to warn you, Jordan, we don't we don't talk about string theory here on Astronomy Cast. No, we talk about things that are provable. Oh, poor string theory. Poor sad string theory. Any more questions? Or so, so we have Patreon office hours mm -hmm. in an hour, I think. Um, maybe half an hour. Mm -hmm. Susie will have emailed you. Susie, mm -hmm. who is being snowed upon currently. So in all Atlanta? of you, in, yes, all of you in Georgia and Florida who don't understand this white, wet, frozen stuff falling out of the sky, it's slippery. Be careful, be safe, be warm, and welcome to winter. <laughs> We've got just this awful fog that sets in around this time of the year, and it's just everywhere. But the upside is you can go up the mountain. And if you go up the mountain, 20 minute drive and you're up in the sunshine and it's beautiful, a little colder, yeah. but then it's we, also not sort of just foggy and damp. So yeah, it's worth doing. We've hit the time of year where a clear sunshiny day means that there's nothing protecting the heat from radiating away. So it's glorious and really cold. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, OPT sends us these telescopes and sort of like on the nights that you do get nice clear skies, You've got to go out and brave the cold, cold weather. But apparently, I, I'm thinking I may go up into our attic, which isn't heated, and open the window and observe through the open window in the attic. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm going to uh, set up the telescope and then sit inside the house and look on the screen as it's, you know, taking its images. That works too. Yeah. Um, so I guess one reminder, which is that in about five days, the 13th, is the Geminids meteor shower. Yes. And that is yes. one of the best meteor showers of the year. So if you're into meteor showers and who isn't, this is a good one. And it's even better because it's going to be a fairly new moon. So you won't have the moon wrecking the sky. The Geminids are produce one to two meters per hour in nice dark skies so it's a really good show it just happens to be cold unless you live in the southern hemisphere and then you're laughing but then i guess the perseids suck for you so anyway this is your this is your chance and yep and there's no moon you don't need to destroy the moon it was already destroyed it wasn't destroyed it was misplaced it's gone here you go. Three Studio Mike wants to know why does fusion stop at iron? No one will tell me why. I had a stunt. Oh. 
Why won't anyone tell you why? That's a it's simple the, question. It's a secret, and it is a, it is a secret that you were never meant to know. It's a simple question. I don't know why no one answered this for you. It's possible so, that there's a series that someone has answered this question. Yeah, but... so so we have like a whole episode on it somewhere. Yeah. Um, but the short answer is everything lighter than that on the periodic table, when you fuse things together inside of a star, it produces energy. At that particular atom, you try and fuse things together. It's like, uh, uh, I'm eating energy. I'm not releasing energy. And since you can't fuse things together to release energy, the star's like not burning anymore. I'm done. Watch me supernova. And that's all there is to it. It's that turning point between produces energy through fusion and requires energy for fusion. And a great analogy for that is that it is the, the energy equivalent of ash. So, oh, yeah, right? that's a good way to think yeah. of it. Yeah, so, so, you know, when you've got wood and you light it on fire, then the wood burns and it produces energy. Yeah. But once you've got ash, you can't light it on fire and you can't produce any more energy out of, out of the ash. It's done. And that's yes. what it is. So when you fuse iron, you can't extract any more energy. And the whole point of a star is that it is – it is this balance between the energy that's coming out from the fusion and the gravitational force that's pushing inward. The moment the star turns to iron, that outward force stops. And then all of those out the all of those, those outward layers collapse inward and you get your supernova and you get your black hole. Uh, 3D Studio Mike is asking why what is it about the sort of this the 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 math i guess what is the sort of the particle physics math of why you get it, it comes down to binding energies above that atoms want to fall apart and so they release energy when the atoms fall apart you have fission reactions instead that release energy um smaller atoms are perfectly happy holding themselves together and they are actually a more energetically um they have a lower energy to hold themselves together when you fuse them. So carbon is happier to be put together than a hydrogen all by its lonesome is one way to think of it. But as you get to bigger atoms, they're not as stable. They're not as well held together and they would rather fall apart than be put together. And so, I mean, beyond fusion, it's still bad. It's just fusion is that point that a star ratchets up to where the the outward energy shuts off i mean if if it switched to i don't know whatever comes after iron you know but switch to gold or whatever's further it, along none of that that doesn't fuse and produce energy either no right no so nothing above that point fuses and produces energy it's it's literally a turning point from produces energy to requires energy to be put in right it is amazing how much of that spare energy that is there in all of that hydrogen that forms up a vast majority of the entire universe. There's so much energy just locked there and, and ready to go. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've reached the end of our episode. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, if you haven't already, go to the wshcrew.space to join the chat that's going on here. They're, of course, the executive producers of both this show and the Weekly Space Hangout. And they're a great group of people. And if you want to kind of go further, that is a place to go. WSHcrew.space. Dot space. I say that too quickly now. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone for watching today. Thanks, Pamela. I guess I've got some some reading homework to do before next week. Yes. I didn't know this was going to be a multi part series. So, um, we will uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Okay. See you later.